I'll pay later. You know, that's not what we have. But when it comes to the healthcare industry or healthcare business, you see people wanting you to treat them first and they expect you not to collect money. In fact, they feel like, why should you even collect money? It's a menace that we really need to look into and start correcting. So I said, it's important for you to understand the industry called healthcare because it's with your in understanding of the industry that you'll be able to make the most of the industry. Always remember that everybody that needs your service already has an emotional issue. And getting money out of those that already have an emotional issue or problem is actually the easiest, but there are ways to go about it. Because if you go about it in the wrong way, you eventually will get your fingers burnt and you might never even get to financial freedom. So it is important to understand that the healthcare industry is a very sensitive industry where your intelligent quotient has to be very high. And it's also an industry that has a lot of people. I mean, in the sense that it caters for every citizen, rich, poor, old, young, Christian, Muslim, every human being on earth, all right, need healthcare. So it's a very massive industry that you cannot even value the industry. If you come to aesthetics, beauty and aesthetics, you can value what it is. I think it's about right now, it's about 40 something million dollars. Now, if you come to uh, the makeup and um, uh, beauty industry, you can value it. If you come to the mining industry, you can value it. If you come to the legal services, you can value it. But when you come to healthcare, it is very difficult for you to value that industry. It's a very massive industry. It's an industry that has endless opportunities. All right? And that's why the first thing I'm mentioning is that you have to have a good understanding of the industry. Now, quickly, you also need to identify the challenges of the industry. Now, I don't want to just come here and give you paper or theories. I'm talking to you from the things that has worked for me by God's grace. All right? You, you, you need to identify the challenges of the industry. When people talk about issues in healthcare, how do you contribute? What, what, what are the things that comes to your mind when you hear that one of the issues with general hospital is maintenance? What comes to your mind when you hear stuff like that? What comes to your mind when you hear that if not for the fact that there are no equipment, this hospital would have done better? What comes to your mind when you hear such problems? Always understand that the identification of a problem is a pathway to wealth. The moment you're able to identify the problem, it, there is already a pathway to wealth. I say that again, the identification of a problem is a pathway to wealth. So the moment you are able to identify the problem, it is important for you to not start brainstorming on the best way all right, to solve those problems. And the problem of healthcare is so much that the healthcare system is about to crash and a lot of doctors, medical personnel are not seeing it yet to take a vantage position. And that's the reason why until the, uh, the bad pandemic, which is the COVID, the attitude of many Nigerians, especially the well-to-do, the top class, all right, towards healthcare was very poor. In fact, they had lost hope in Nigerian healthcare until COVID happened, and most of them could not leave the shores of this country. That was when they started paying more attention to their healthcare and also respect Nigerian healthcare. As I speak to you right now, there are a lot of opportunities, which I'm still going to mention very soon, all right, in the healthcare space. And sometimes I wonder that how come nobody's already doing this? Because our curriculum in the first place are trained doctors and not necessarily trained entrepreneurs such that the curriculum is so streamlined to train good doctors but to meet the needs outside the four walls of the hospital becomes a problem of course also remembering that many of our teachers our lecturers all right were good doctors that became professors 
academicians that were all their lives within the four walls of the teaching hospitals. And when they give examples, their examples are always around the hospital, the bed, and sometimes they tell, tell us about how they went for a conference in the US and how they do all of that. Quite a number of them have not handled issues that are outside the four walls of the hospital. And that is the reason why if care is not taken, the healthcare system that we have right now being managed by healthcare workers might not try. Why? Because quite a number of them don't have experiences that is rounded enough to run those industries. Can you still hear me? Yes, I'm a call came in, so I need to be sure that you can still hear me because the call came in. Yes, sir, we can hear you. I'm so sorry, a call came in and it ended my call. So sorry about that. So what I was saying is identify the problem, then think outside the box. All of this thing I'm saying, I'll start giving examples to make it look like brighter and better. Think outside the box, all right? Get a new orientation. Get a new orientation. Now, the first time I came to Lagos, I was employed as a manager, all right, at Reddington Hospital, the new branch back then. That's um, Admiralty Way, uh, Reddington Admiralty Way. And I discovered that one of the things that the owner of Reddington, Reddington actually belongs to one man, all right? And that hospital, in fact, they, they have a branch that has about 150 beds, okay? 150 beds, and it belongs to just one man. I discovered that his orientation about healthcare was different from every other person. Now, there is an orientation that has been sold to us in medical school. When you come out of school, you have to first and foremost kill that orientation. Some of those orientations were sold to us passively and some were sold to us actively. And on top of that list is intra- you know, interprofessional, you know, beefs, fights, and challenges. I tell you the truth, I kid not. Anybody that wants to do something major in healthcare must come out with a different orientation of the fact that the healthcare system is a team system such that no particular team can run alone. No particular team, no profession in the healthcare system can actually run alone. If you want to really create what is sustainable and will stand the test of time. I discovered that one of the first things that that man, that is uh, my ogre back then when I was a Reddington, understood is, is the team spirit, regardless of the subtle or the passive or the active orientation that was sold in school. The second orientation is that you have to be within the four walls of the hospital, which I'm already debunking. I'm sure some of you already know that. You already know that that doesn't even hold water. All right. Now, the next thing I want to talk about briefly is learn to collaborate. Complement, don't compete. Learn to collaborate. Let's learn to collaborate. I'm still going to come to that. And the next one is jack many trades. You know, there is this saying that says, and my time is past tense. There's this saying that says, jack of all trades, master of none. I'm sure quite a number of us know that that statement is not complete. If you check Google, you will discover that that statement is an half statement. The full statement is master of uh, jack of all trades, master of none is often better than master of one. So I tell every young person I have the privilege to talk to, that jack as many trades as possible. You're talking to me right now. I am also a police officer. I jacked that trade. I have done, I, I used to have an issue when I was in part one, no, part two, 
that was when I bought my postcard. I had an eatery that could see 30 people. Initially, I was selling more money to fresh out. Later, I became a big eatery. After that, I stopped that for a reason. I was still in medical school. Then I started a printing press. My printing press was so big that I, I started making close to like a 2 million, 3 million, sometimes in a month, sometimes 500K, sometimes 1 million. In about my whole all university, and I was still in medical school. I was jacking many trades. I was using all of those opportunities to train myself. And when it was time for me to do the major thing I wanted to do, I already understood how to handle staff. I understood how to hold meetings, how to bargain, how to enter into big places and negotiate. So you jack many trades. If all the things you know how to do is just medicine and healthcare, it might be a little bit difficult, all right, for you to even infer knowledge and transfer knowledge from other industries. So it is not too late. Try as much as you can to not limit your opportunities to only healthcare. Jack as many trades as possible. With time, you will get to know the one to drop and the one to pick up. Now, what are the very close opportunities that you can quickly lash on, all right, to make money in this kind of economy? Because the truth is, we will all not travel. Yeah, I know there is a Japan syndrome that favors medical practitioners, nurses, doctors, pharmacies, um, sonographers, radiologists, dental doctor, um, dentists, and all of that. However, Every one of us will not japa, even though we have the privileges and the opportunity to japa. And it means that within the scope of the opportunities in Nigeria, you have to hold them strongly. And one of the first, I don't know, I think quite a number of you are in Abuja, but I might not be able to speak directly for the population in Abuja, but I'm just going to try and speak for Nigeria as a whole. Ultrasonography. I've discovered that ultrasonography does not belong to any profession in the healthcare space. Forget the fact that they say it's for sonographers, it's for radiologists. It's a diagnostic tool. It's as good as our stethoscope. It's as good as the multi-parameter cardiac monitor. It's a diagnostic tool. Now, if I tell you the amount I made from ultrasonography in 2000. 19, you will be amazed. In fact, there was a time that I was having close to 500 scans in a month. And this 500 scan, back then was about 2,000 there. You can multiply that. Now, as a medical doctor, nothing stops you, all right, if it is something you're interested in. You can actually have a diagnostic center. You can have an ultrasound, all right, um, machine. Learn it. In fact, there is a four-day curriculum to learn ultrasound. I did that for about two years before I stopped. I was training people on how to use the ultrasound. All right? Yeah, four days. The curriculum I wrote, because I'm a member of ISO, of International Society of Obstetrics and Gynecology, ultrasonography. I'm a, I'm, a, I'm a member. All right? I'm a card, card carry member. Now, you can learn ultrasound within four days, and it can change your financial income. Like it can change your income forever. Imagine citing an ultrasound scan center in a place where you have a lot of people, pregnant women. I mean, you just learn it. You can even employ a sonographer if you really want to. And you can actually do it yourself. You can also set up a lab. I could remember I set up my first lab and diagnostic center in the year... 2018 or 2019. And today, when I check my account, till now it's still running. The money just keep popping. I can't remember the last time I went there. Maybe like two or three months ago. I just employed a manager that gives me reports. All right. So you can start a lab. You can start a diagnostic center. I can help some of you consult on how to start it and what to do. Now, you can also invest in an established facility. This is not common, but again, I tell you the truth that it is not all of us, like we all will not 
have that flair for business or entrepreneur. But the little money you're making, you're getting a salary. If you put that money in the bank, it reduces per time. But imagine looking for a structured healthcare facility that you can invest in. The moment you know that there's an investment opportunity in an existing healthcare facility, all you need to do is to ensure that the papers are right, get the lawyer involved, get the lawyer of the other um, facility involved, come into an agreement, let your money work for you. You put in maybe a 1 million, 2 million, 4 million, 5 million. Every month, something comes to you. Your capital is still intact. All you need to do when you need your money is to give them a two month notice based or depending on the policy that facility is running. And you give them a two month or three month notice, they give you back your capital. But during the time that your capital is with them, they are giving you a kind of um, profit, shared profit now, not return on investment, shared profit every month. That won't come to you if you leave that money in bank. Think about it. Now, another thing is capital pool. You know, I was in the midst of some healthcare um, gurus in Lagos and quite a number of them, when I asked them, they, they invited me for a talk like this. And I did a, I did a kind of um, uh, a research, a, a mini research in that room. Everybody wanted to own a hospital. Everybody sitting in that room wanted to own a hospital. And by the time I did my further questioning, I discovered that not all of them would be able to run a hospital. So the question is, they don't even have the capital to start the hospital as individuals. But when we, when I asked all of them what they have for maybe an healthcare facility, an amount they have that they can let go for an investment, when we added all of the money in the room together, all right, of course, it was a gathering of about 20 something people. Could you believe that all of them, if they put their money together, which is called capital pool, they can start an healthcare facility that will give them or make all of them achieve what they needed to achieve. The only thing to do is to, what is your interest? Do you want to make money or you want to see people get healed? I resigned from um, oil and gas to come and start my hospital. And it wasn't money that I was looking for, even though I would like to have money. But money was not my target because what if I tell you that for the first one year plus, no profit was coming in and I wasn't collecting salary anymore. So my interest was not to multiply money in the first few years, but my mom died of a poor health care or as a result of poor health care. And I said I was going to establish something that would give back to the community good health care in this country, which is passion. But don't forget where I started from. Passion cannot drive itself because we live in an economical world. But there is a balance. If time permits, I'm going to get there. Now, standardized home care services is another thing that is very um, quite missing in this country. What if I tell you that from Lagos, I still supply some category of people, doctors and nurses in Abuja from Lagos. Most of these people, I've never seen them before in my life. But many times, they call me, so so person, I don't want to mention names, the people that live in my Tama, Asokoro, yeah, they call me, so so person is flying in, he needs a doctor, so so person lost his child or lost a child, they need a doctor to be around. In fact, last month, I still had three doctors that worked for me at a particular place, and I'm here in Lagos. So it tells you that even within your immediate environment, there are actually healthcare needs. But if you've closed your eyes to the opportunities in this country because you want to jack back, it is very difficult for you to see those opportunities. And two, if you also limit your horizon, like your scope to the four walls of the hospital, you might never see some of these opportunities. Now, you can also come together or you have a sponsor. You can write a good proposal. I can help with that to start an ambulance service within Abuja or even outside Abuja. Because again, quite a number of people don't understand that ambulance service is also a very lucrative business. 
I have an ambulance service and I can tell. In fact, there are some times that my ambulance service goes out and comes back just one single trip with a millionaire, depending on who I'm carrying and where I'm carrying the patient to. So you can also think of an ambulance service. You can also think of running um, an online clinic. Okay. There is a there's a particular app I'm working um, on now uh, with some of my partners in the US and in India. It's just like um, Amazon, healthcare Amazon. That's the way I can describe it. Where you where I have converted all healthcare services to products. So you can buy malaria treatment, you can buy a uh, cesarean session, you can cut, you can cut uh inography. All right, they just tell you where you will go and do it. The hospital close to you, so they will give you a call and you go and get your, your surgery done. You would speak with, with, with the surgeon online, do everything. They'll come to your house to take your sample, they'll come to your house to run all your diagnostics, including S ray, ultrasound, all of those. The only one they can do in your house is MRI and CT scan. We're almost done. I'm sure by that we are done. I would like to come back to inform all of you. So that you can make you can take advantage of it. So, as medical officers, as consultants, you can come on that page and just consult and make money at your leisure time. I mean, all you need to do just register. You can you will be the one to even um, impute the amount you want to collect. So it's a marketplace. Everybody comes with their product and services. Like I said, we have converted all of the services to product. So let's say, doctor. Uh, Bruce now wants to consult for one hour for 15k. Dr. Ahmed Idris wants to consult for 10k. Dr. Um, Fumi Ade wants to consult for 5k. Dr. Fumi Ade has um, reviews and number of stars. Same with other doctors. The patient will look through and say, I would like to consult with this doctor. The moment the patient decides to consult with that doctor, the patient pays, the payment comes to our app and from our app the doctor gets his own commission immediately so deriving from online platforms like that um in the country and i believe strongly that uh, by the time my own app comes up you you are definitely going to know about it i would like to come back and inform you about it so you can register on, on like you can even search around there are quite a number of apps like that already but it's just that they are not as rounded as the app that I'm creating. My app is 360 care first, and we are still on it. We've already done piloting. We've started testing it, but we've not really pushed it into the um, society yet. It's actually for Africa, but we are starting with Nigeria, then we move to Ghana, then Kenya. All right. So another thing is healthcare management. You can take courses now. I will pause a little bit here to save this one. Like many hospitals in Nigeria are dying natural then. And the reason is because gone are the days where you have hospitals where the doctor is the pharmacist, the doctor is the HR, the doctor is the billing officer, the doctor is the accountant. You know, when they were running that kind of medical facility, hospitals were small. We never had hospitals like Reddington that is a multinational international we never had hospitals like Evercare until they started having proper structure to hospital that divides every healthcare facility into the clinicals and administrative, in which from research, the administrative harm of the hospital, all right, is actually contributing 80% to the success of the hospital. Maybe that's the reason why our um, general hospitals are not working. Because we would rather attribute the success of the hospital to the clinicals and not administrative. If you sell Amala and I come to your restaurant to eat Amala and your Amala is sweet, there's no reason for me to give you kudos because your Amala ought to be sweet. But if I come to your restaurant, the way you're serving the Amala, the packaging of the Amala, the administration that went into bringing the amala to my table is more important than how sweet the amala is. It's the same thing for healthcare. And that's why I can, I can give you many instances and examples, experiential examples on how 
many hospitals die a natural death because they refuse to understand that 80% of the success of the hospital comes from the administrative and not the clinical. Am I saying the clinical is not important? No, it is. But 80% of the success of the hospital comes from the administrative. And it means that if there is anybody that would have a better or more advantageous ground in healthcare management, it would be the doctors, the nurses, the pharmacists, the people that have a strong background of healthcare. Even in, in my class, when I was in, in the college for um, healthcare management consultants, consultants rather, all the people that did gratefully well were either doctors or nurses or pharmacists. You see, those other administrators that came because they wanted to be part of healthcare, like some people that studied philosophy and they were grasping with it. I mean, when we mention some things, they just have the book knowledge. And that's why you see that in, in any healthcare facility right now, go and find out. Practice managers earn more than medical doctors. In fact, practice managers earn more than some consultants. And the question is, who is a practice manager? If you want to come to me now with a practice manager that, that is a doctor and a practice manager that studied biochemistry, I would rather prefer to employ that practice manager that is a doctor. As a doctor, you can be a practice manager. As a doctor, you can be a quality assurance officer. In fact, as a doctor, you can be an HMO management consultant. Right now, they will prefer doctors because I've, I've consulted for a, a, a branch of Axa Mansard before when they were doing their employment. So we can go on and on and on like that because 30 minutes will actually be a small time for me to explain more on some of these, these things. But this actually weighs a subtle way that it's still a green, in fact, healthcare is still a green ocean. I learned of a particular facility on the mainland. Mm -hmm. Let me say this in closing. They opened a particular unit that may, maybe some of you might not like. It's actually plastic, BBL, and liposuction. I just opened that unit in my own clinic, in my own hospital. And if I tell you the amount I've been able to make from just BBL and um, liposuction, quite a number of my clients also come from Abuja. Now, that facility, I won't mention their name, they, 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 they had 1,000, for those of you that know mathematics very well, please listen. They had 1,000 clients in 2023 for plastics, plastic surgery. These are these BBL, liposuction, vaginoplasty, and all of that. And each of the surgery that I know of, they will make about 1.5 million profits on each of the surgery. If you multiply that by 1,000, that's about 1.5 billion. Let me announce to you that organizations that will be able to raise 1.5 billion in this country today within 365 days. I'm not sure they are up to four. I'm saying industry that will do that. I'm not sure they are up to four. Or I'm not sure they are up to 10. This is what LT has been able to achieve. So the more you get outside the box, the more you start thinking, the more you start collaborating, the more you start attending programs like this, the easier and better it is for us to come into financial freedom. Thank you. All right, sir. Thank you so much, sir. That was so inspiring and very rich. Thank you so much, sir. So um, for our attendees, we'll be taking questions now. So if you have a question, just drop it in the chat box. I'll read it out for our speaker to give us answers to that. So some of you already sent a direct message that you have questions. Just drop them in the chat box. I'll read them as they come. Waiting for your questions.
Okay, um, someone is sending me a direct message. Let's send it here. Maybe I'll read it from you. All right, favor T, please ask your question. While I'm waiting for the question, something came to my mind that right. was very amazing throughout um, last week. I've been thinking about it. So, because I started a plastic surgery unit, all my patients mm -hmm. needed lymphatic drainage. And this lymphatic drainage has to be done by a masseuse, so to speak. And all the masseuse does is just to drain the fluid, all right, from the body. What if I tell you that this masseuse collects 30,000 naira per patient, per client? And when she came, the last time she came, I had four patients on the ward that just finished their um, BPL. And guess what? This masseuse did not go to school. She's not learned. She just learned the art, so to speak, of draining. She doesn't know anatomy. She doesn't know physiology. She doesn't even know how to prevent infection or aseptic unit and aseptic uh, rules and uh, procedures. But guess what? She came to my hospital. She spent average minute of maybe 10 on each of the clients. She did four clients for me that morning and I gave her 120,000 hours. She finished everything within 40 minutes to 15 minutes. And I gave her 120,000 naira. And guess what? She did that for four days. So four days, I gave her 480,000 naira. And while they were done in my hospital, I discharged them to my um, aftercare home. They were my aftercare home for 10 days. So I told her I can't pay her 30K for 10 days per patient, that I'm going to pay her 15K. So she collected 15K for 10 days. That's 150K per patient. 150K times three. She collected 600K for me. So from just my four patients, this young lady has made over a million naira within 10 days. Think about it. She did not go to school. She's from a choir bomb. She only learned how to train people that have just finished plastic surgery. I will have a lot of health workers, doctors, nurses. I mean, even some consultants are not boast of that money in a month. This girl made. I'm not saying I heard of. She worked for me. I paid her that money within 10 days. All right. Our questions, please. I mean, that's just a, a, something to think about. Good evening, sir. Good evening. Oh, thank you so much for this session. It was, it was really, really amazing. And it has been very, very helpful. And it's opened my eyes to a lot of things. I want to ask, considering the economic situation of Nigeria today, um, a lot of doctors in training do not have the funding, first of all, to even do this. Apart from pulling resources together, like you earlier mentioned, what other alternative funding measures do you think people can access? Medical doctors, especially young medical doctors, can access to enable them get into the industry of healthcare passing. Okay, yeah. So again, they actually grant, they are grants. But one thing about grants is that you must have done something. And that takes me to um, volunteering, all right? It's something that is a bit missing in this generation because quite a number of people are also taking volunteering for um, granted. All right, but it doesn't still mean that you can still use that opportunity. Imagine you volunteering for a very big hospital where you're just learning, and while you're learning, you are gathering experiences, you're taking pictures, then you're doing outreaches intentionally. There's something they call OPM, other people's money. So there are some people that have money, but they don't they won't give it to you to go and do business, but they will give it to you to go and do outreach. So imagine if you are close to a nurse, you're also close to a pharmacist, you are close to maybe a, a lab technician or a lab scientist, and all of you like that, four of you, you form a consortium, all right? And you decide to do maybe a public service and you meet some of those ministers, senators, whatever in Abuja, all right? And you sell that idea to them. 
from there you have pictures you have pictures the day you are going to write for a grant all right you have something to send that so you can access money through grants you can access money through opn if you write a proposal to me as a young uh, medical officer and you've not done anything before the question is am i so sure that you use that money judiciously but the moment they see pictures they see that you are all out like yeah you, for example while i was serving I was the best serving copper in Africa. I divided all my allowance every month into two. I used app for community services because I was intentional about living and I delayed gratification. Many people thought I was foolish, but I knew what I was doing. So I was using app for my money because I wanted to become the best serving copper. The moment I left, I used that best serving copper to get a grant to do a cervical cancer screening for the whole of the state. From there, I had pictures. I also used it again to get another grant. Like that, like that. So whenever I stand in places now and I talk to them and I say, I was the best serving copper, I got grants in this, I've attended to about 5,000 people, I've done this before, you know, they know that this guy knows what he's doing. So they give you the opportunity. I hope I was able to answer your question. Thank you, sir. Please go Right, for a doctor in training, um, let me see. Uh, I mentioned quite a number. For a doctor in training, for a doctor in training, you can have a, you can have, you can if you have funding for maybe your dad, your mom, angel investors, you can you can have a diagnostic center. Trust me, you can have an ultrasound center. You can have a pharmacy. Actually, all you need to do is just employ a pharmacy. You know the way it feels like when you have a pharmacy, and don't forget that some of these pharmacies you see around, they are not even pharmacies, and they are prescribing drugs to people and all of that. Now, if I know that this pharmacy belongs to a doctor in training, you are the one calling it in training, people out there know that this is the doctor. I would rather want to go there than to go to another guy that is not a doctor, but it's just pulling drugs together for me and telling me to go and use it. So as a medical officer in training, all right, you can start making plans for all of this, but for you to make more money right now, apps that you can, because on the app, actually, uh, I think we have room for medical uh, officers and medical doctors in training, yes, and residents, but it's just that your own charges will be less than that of maybe a reg and a senior reg. And if you feel you want to charge as much as the charge, of course, you really want to determine the prices that the patient will say, okay, I think I want to buy my healthcare product from this person, which is actually a service if you were listening to me before. So those are the, yeah. And you can also do capital pool because never think any money is too small. All I, I, I started my diagnostic center with back then was barely 300,000 back then. So what I did was that I rented a shop. I did the slabs. I didn't register first because registration is not the first thing. I got a lab tech, um, lab scientist that was my friend. He gave me his license. I gave him the percentage of the lab, all right, because I couldn't pay him at that time. And I went to the market. I went to buy all of the, uh, not all the equipment yet, the side lab, all of the cassettes, and few of the equipment. I think everything I spent was less than 300. And I started. So sometimes people want to start big. Yeah, you can start big, it's not bad. But if you don't have the money to start big, you can actually start small. All right. And sometimes too, that your small money, it could just be that you are supplying a particular hospital um, gloves as minute as that is. Let me, let me say this to you. You know that when COVID started, the first three months of COVID, I made about 32 million naira. My first million came from selling face masks. In fact, I supplied more than 500 cartons of face masks I sent to Abuja because of the house of rep and house of selling. So, and I didn't start that big. It will start with one carton, two carton. So when COVID came, I knew where to buy. And I had some money with me and I bought and I sold. So if you want people to invest in you, start first. You can actually start, no matter how, when the person said, 
small money. I want to know the amount. Even if it is 5K, you can start saving that 5K. Start saving that 5K. And if you have 5K, imagine you have 5K and you people are 10. If 10 of you come together to drop for 5K, that's 10K. I mean, I always encourage young people to collaborate. Let's collaborate. Let's collaborate. With collaboration, you will do more. All you need to do is to get your paperwork set. I don't need to have 100% of my company. If I have 20% of a one billionaire company, I'm already a billionaire. Now. So that is the way it is. That's where I think. If you know the number of collaborations I'm into, my God. Sometimes I've forgotten some of them. It's when I see the alarm or I see um, messages for meetings. That's when I used to remember. I just like collaborating. You have an idea, yeah? let me blow it up for you. Let's collaborate. Let's make money. That's just it. Our parents did not like collaborating because they feel like if you collaborate, they will kill you or they will send one juju to come and kill you. And most of them, quite a number of them, didn't really do big stuff. I hope I was able to answer that question sometime. I, I am aware that we have another speaker. Yeah, thank you very much, sir. We have just two questions left. So I'll quickly read the second one. Please, how can one be in synchronization with the current trends in medicine, particularly health tech? For example, this person asking this question is a UI slash UX designer. How can he be in sync with a healthcare organization and lend his services? Okay. Go back to your LinkedIn. Go and rearrange your LinkedIn. Ensure that the first thing they see on your LinkedIn is a UI UX, then doctor. Is that okay? I can tell you for free that one of the reasons why I have a big collaboration with one of the major companies in India and US right now is because I have a background in healthcare and I do other things. The moment they saw those other things and they knew that I am a board certified member of the healthcare management board, all right, and they now got to know that I'm also into the healthcare space, they opened up to me immediately and they were ready to sponsor all of my deals. Okay, then join their community, go to Instagram, search for that community, join the community on Instagram. Join the community on every social media platforms. Research and check for somebody that is already doing what you're doing. Follow that person. If possible, reach out to that person that you would like him to mentor you. All right. You might think they will not answer you, but they will. A lot of people have come to my LinkedIn page, my Instagram page, and they'll just send me a direct message. And some of them to date, we've done things together. In fact, some of them will now share bread, like we share money together. So don't, don't be scared. The ideas they will tell you is no. That's the worst thing that can ever happen. And I can tell you for free that there's no no anywhere. Every no is not always a no. Every no is not always a no. No is not usually or always a no. If you go back again, every no can become a yes. So don't, don't be scared of trying. Join communities. Change your LinkedIn profile. Be active online. Don't let the cumbersome work in the hospital consume all your life because at the end of the day all right it, it leads to frustration if you cannot meet up with the economical demands that is before you thank you thank you so much sir and for thank the you. final question um, many thanks sir for this very enlightening session so you mentioned you did business in school as a medical student what business can one engage in that will be a daily commodity for students, especially in the classroom, and won't consume time? Okay. So, as a medical student, there are many businesses you can do. You just So, when you talk about business, all right, before you talk about business, it's actually busyness. So, you would ask yourself, what are the things that keeps you busy? And how many of them can you actually drop? Because back then, when I was doing business, I didn't have a girlfriend. I didn't have another life. Like, all I did was school, music, of course, church, all right, and business. Then later, I added politics. But where I'm going to is that it depends on the area where you are at, actually. Now, you can sell gadgets to lecturers. You can sell gadgets to students, and it depends on the capital that you have. If that person can maybe get me to get to chat with me privately, I can ask some questions that can guide that person to make a lot of money. I can remember there was a time I was in school and I had 
Tao Bolo, we call them Tao Bolo, that's the indigenous of people that I trusted. They were going to quarters to wash cars for me. So I will approach the lecturers before they wake up in the morning. I'll take these guys to the quarters. They'll wash all their cars with their water and their soap, and I'll collect money. The time they also have spent at the car wash, they don't spend time at the car wash. So I, I take these boys. I wasn't the one washing the car, but I just had the idea. So you can actually use people, but just make sure you're not taking so much of money. Because when I was running my e tree, it got to a point that I wasn't the one cooking anymore. When I was running the printing press, I wasn't the one designing anymore. All right. It got to a point where I didn't design anymore. But you might be the one to start it first, or you might even employ people to start it. The most important thing that is needed there is money and your brain, small money actually, and your brain. Then your ability to organize people, then your ability to deny yourself of some fun, and you face it, delay gratification. Thank you. All right, sir. Thank you so much. Um, someone is asking through what means they'll be able to contact you in future if they need guidance in setting up any of the businesses or parasitals that you've talked about. Mm, I can share my number. <laughs> okay, sir. So okay, I, I think I can also reach out to you maybe on social media, any of the social media. Uh, so again, my social media and the, because I also do music. So the music okay. is 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 overwhelming and it has consumed my social media space yeah especially my instagram i have about 10 11 000 followers and i can tell you that 90 percent of those people are following me because of the music so you can imagine so my number i'm typing it in the, in the chat box right now you can reach me on oh, thank you very much sir we are very grateful so for this, this is my outline <laughs> this is my outline actually <laughs> Don't but please, oh, if you ask, if you ask um, our facilitator, chatting me doesn't mean that I will respond immediately. But you can be yes, sure that I will respond. Very true. <laughs> <laughs> you can be sure that I will respond, and it's because I'm involved in so many things, so many things. If I want to drop some, but again, to whom much is given, much is expected. I'm involved in so many things that as soon as I leave here, now I'm going to the studio for a musical production. So you can imagine. All right. So, but if you chat me, and um, when I when I read it, maybe at my free time, I could just please send a voice note or send a chat because I want you to also like be great so that greatness can be common. I'm hundred percent sure that one day, someday, some of you on this page right now will meet somewhere, somewhere, and we'll just laugh and talk about this day. I'm hundred percent sure. Yeah. And guess what? If this is the last thing I'm going to say, there is nothing that is not achievable. I tell you the truth, I lie me. Nothing. You see all those big hospitals that you see? It can actually be your name. You can have it. It's not a big deal. Is that okay? You know, I told you earlier that my background is in nursing. Think about it. If a nurse can achieve this thing, how much more? Uh, here you know. So you can actually do it. Let me demystify all these big things. There is nothing in it. You can do it. You can solve. You can. You can give a solution that the whole Nigeria would. Let me say this. I know this is a public place, and most likely this is a record. The proposal that was read during the opening of COVID, the airspace was written by my team. The proposal that was read for the solution to open the airspace during COVID, after COVID, by the then Minister of Aviation and Boss Mustafa was written by my team. So you can brainstorm and give solutions to the nation. I tell you the truth, I lie not. It's just see, and that's what one thing I said. I I I I want to say it carefully. The moment you get out of school, first drop that pride. I'm sorry I found it that way. First drop it. Start thinking of collaborating. Like forget about whether you are a medical doctor or not. If the person that has sense and that knows the way is a lab technician. Parley with that person. If the person that knows the way is a, a lab scientist, don't say I'm a doctor. No, 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 no. Parley with that person. Because sometimes those people, they know where well. the person that took me to market to buy everything I bought for my lab was a lab technician. Do you understand what I'm saying? 
So the moment you leave school, drop some orientation. And that's all right now. How many doctors are, I'm sorry, but how many health workers can come out with you wagon? You know, when we were in school, there's a way we look at those people that did philosophy and all those other courses as though they were um, misfortune or life didn't treat them well. But the question is how far after school? You will discover that life after school is not like that because the university is supposed to give you a kind of orientation. When you leave school, what you do with the orientation is more important than your profession. I'm sorry, but it's just the truth. Thank you. Thank you so much, sir. We are very grateful. Everyone, please, can we send our appreciation and the chat box for... Thank you so uh, much. So I need to leave now. It's almost seven. Ooh, one minute to seven. I have a meeting right. by seven. Thank, Thank you, you so much. Please permit well, me to leave good. the call. Yes, sir. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, sir. All right, guys. So that brings to end the first session. We have a second speaker who is already about to join the meeting. Um, you would have seen his name on the flyer. Yes, for those asking about the recording of the meeting, and um, we're working on that, it should be available. So hold on, the second, you know, we tend to say we'll save the best for the last. So the second session promises to be very exciting and thrilling. Um, when he comes on board, I will introduce him and read his profile to our hearing. Let me just reach out to him to tell him that we are ready. Thank you. Just hold on for a bit. Okay. Once again, good evening, everybody. Our second speaker is here with us. Good evening, sir. Hello, good evening. I hope you can hear me. Yes, sir. We can hear you. Thank you very much okay. for honoring our invitation. We count it a privilege to have you speak to us this evening, sir. So, um, everyone, I'll briefly read the profile of our speaker. Is Dr. Emmanuel Duware, MD. He's a graduate from the College of Medicine at the University of Benin. Dr. Emmanuel Duware is a member of the Society of Family Physicians of Nigeria, as well as the Royal College of Emergency Medicine, United Kingdom. Whilst in medical school, he was the national president of the Christian Medical and Dental Students Nigeria, the largest of such globally. He's currently practicing in the United Kingdom, where he also functions in the field of research and as a medical educator. During the COVID-19 pandemic, he was the Deputy Coordinator Rapid Response Team for Infectious Diseases, University of Benin Teaching Hospital. He won the Vice President National Health Grant Award in 2021. He was nominated as the overall best staff in University of Benin Teaching Hospital in 2021 and 2020. Best Clinical Staff, UBTH, in 2019, overall, overall Best Doctor, 2018 and 2017, at the General Practice Clinic, Department of Family Medicine, University of Benin Teaching Hospital. He's passionate about mentoring young professionals like us. When he's not in the medical arena, he engages in discourses on philosophy, politics, and nation building. Other issues of interest for him include promoting research and entrepreneurship in the health and education, educational sectors. He is reputed to have made the first genetic diagnosis of Alport syndrome, a rare hereditary kidney disease in West Africa, and one of the most recent in Africa, a feat which put Nigeria on the global map for research on hereditary kidney diseases. He is a speaker of renown and has presented at international medical conferences in Texas, United States of America, in 2023 and in Calgary, Canada in 2022. He has also been invited to speak at the International Medical Conference, Conferences in Cyprus in 2024 
and Cape Town, South Africa in 2025. He is an ordained church minister and is married to the delectable Dr. Mrs. Gloria Oduare, an ordained church minister and a specialist ophthalmologist. It is our privilege to have him with us. Please, with a happy innovation on the chat box, let's welcome Dr. Emmanuel Oduare. Thank you very much, sir. <clears throat> Hello, thank you very much. Um, I thank you for this honor. My special greetings to you all and commendation for convening this wonderful rendezvous in the occasion of your hospital's week. University of Abuja Teaching Hospital, Gwagolada, or Gwax as we colloquially call it. Uh, I think the weather should be cooler now. Gwax is reputed for having very arid weather. I, I served up north in my degree in Borno State when I was serving and I think that's the only juxtaposition that could be made with Gwagolada in terms of heat. Um, outside, of course, UB and um, Sokoto. It was a good evening to you all um, in the UK currently, so our time zones are kind of synchronized or harmonized. So it's about 7 p.m. here too. Um, I guess that's what it is about there. I was speaking as briefly as I can on your theme, and on the thematic thrust of your House of this Week, as I'm acquainted with or so informed, is, um, well, let me just paraphrase it. And discovering opportunities within the local space or uh, probably delineating it as developing financial capacity within the limited um, constraints in the Nigerian healthcare ecosystem. Uh, the reason why I decided to rephrase it is so that we see beyond just money making. One of the downsides to truly gaining ascendancy uh, um, gaining, making impact is to fixate on just money making. What the world really needs, and what the world is looking for, for the most part, is solutions driven ideas, problem solving. The true critical definition of intelligence is problem solving. To what each person who really wants to gain clout, the leverage, some bargaining chip in the world system that's heavily skewed against. Um, let's be frank, low and medium income countries, if you truly want to have a seat at the table, then what you need to do is to build capacity. Okay, and I like to look to young people because when you're young at your stage, when you are still in the day of the profession, you're just beginning, when you're going through that phase of evolution, you have so much ahead of you. Like I keep saying to young persons who come to the ED and mention the department, I'm here in the UK, I just thought, well, when you're young, you're almost invincible. But it's a time to ensure you put the right foot forward, ensure that you make progress steadily. There's a Latin phrase that just came across just now. Um, it's a motto of one of the towns here in the UK, um, Lee Town, and says, um, equal PD propera. It means make haste steadily, make steady progress. And that, for me, underpins what you need to do if you want to maximize opportunities within local space. You need to tell yourself, I'm going to be in ramping up my activities one notch after the other on a steady progress. Like you, you, the, 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 the quest for overnight success often is has a lot of pitfalls. The, what you need to do is to build capacity that has potential for transgenerational transfer. Okay? So... I will just go down, I mean, that foundation, just go down to what I want to talk about briefly. As young persons, you would have, even whilst young now, come to terms with the reality that the medical feed is not really a money spending business if you're an employee. It's clear enough. The good thing is that you're never going to lack in reality. You, 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 your, your income puts you in the top 10% brackets of many Nigerians. You're never really going to lack. But if you want to make real impact, um, that is not enough or sufficient enough to give you that skill, okay? So we need to think broader. I want to think deeper if we're truly going to be impactful. Now, why I'm not so concerned about making pennies and pounds and cents and dollars is because that can become a distraction. What I'm really concerned about is how can we maximize opportunities within our economic space, within the health ecosystem in Nigeria and Africa, and how we can globalize those opportunities. 
Okay. So broadly, the I call it the care domains, C-A-R-E. So you have the clinical, the academic, the re, uh, research, and the entrepreneurial. These four domains uh, opportunities are available to Nigerian professionals, and matter of fact, medical professionals globally to maximize opportunities. The clinical is traditional, hospital setting, um, medical centers, clinics, those outfits. What we need to start thinking of creatively, because this has always been, is how as a young person, do I begin in the next five, 10 years? Because the MCN regulation says, after you've practiced with, for 10 years, then you can be an independent um, um, practitioner. So you can supervise a medical center. How do I in the next 10 years begin to scale up my priorities and leverage on what I have to ensure that I can build something that's different from what is this out there? The time to start thinking about those things as now. So you can give yourself a medium to long-term framework. Medium means about 10 years from now, I want to have built enough capacity such that when I'm setting up a practice, for instance, it's going to serve a niche market. You're in Abuja, um, so you're familiar with Kalina, for instance. Kalina Hospital, um, both um, the couple, um, ENT surgeon and urologist, the wife ENT, the husband urologist, they both train at the University of Benediction Hospital. But whites, way back, they had always thought about their concern was to provide a niche service, which was endoscopic surgery, which is relatively rare in Nigeria. So when you're conceptualizing those ideas, they're relatively rare. But now they adapt for most part. But it took them having to go through that process, go about for some training, get some certifications, whilst others were just pursuing the normal um, um, trainings. They went through resident training at the time, both head in departments of ENT neurology, but they had a vision. And once you have a vision, there's a niche that they saw, and that's where it starts from. And then finally, that there is a lacuna in service provision. So for some persons has become, oh, IVF, some persons it's become um, endoscopic surgeries, for other persons it's radiotherapy. It's one therapeutic modality or the other. There are so many gaps. Because I'm practicing the first word, I can readily tell you this. There's so many gaps in healthcare provision in Nigeria. One critical gap is pre-hospital. Virtually everything about healthcare provision in Nigeria begins at the gates of the hospital. But what makes the healthcare system abroad so advanced is because there is so much investment in pre-hospital care. In terms of conveyance of patients from their homes to the hospital, paramedics, um, EMTs, there's emergency medical um, medical technicians. There's so much of that invested in. So those are niche markets. You can say, okay, I won't create an ambulance service when I leave school. There's some ideas I'm, I'm moving, um, currently um, I'm mulling over. Pre-hospital transfer of patients. There is so much that we can do pre-hospital. The many patients that call paramedics or call the ambulance service here in the West that not even get to the hospital because paramedics attend to them on scene, treat them, and, and that's it. So there's so much that can be done if you're creating that's a niche in the Nigerian market. So you can start planning towards that. My point is, if you, who belongs to this generation, you're planning to set up a clinic in five, 10 years from now, do not think like every other person. You may start like traditional clinic setting, but that should not be your goal. Your goal should be identifying a niche that you want to solve or attend to when you gain capacity. Okay, so the first step is seeking what extra service can I render? And then you can start thinking, okay, do I have to create more specialist output? Okay, how do I get another specialist in? And what are the things we're going to focus on? And how do I access capital? Thankfully, there are some packages coming up now that address specific healthcare benefits. The, there are some VAT exempt um, category of status that we're giving to medical services. The fact is, with the way the world is going and coming globalized, there is just a chance that outsourcing will be the way out for many in the developed world because it's going to be cheaper to provide labor in places like Africa and some other LMI, LMIC countries. So if you strategically position yourself, you could just be that hospital outfit, not some major private hospital in, or even the NHS. The NHS actually in the UK actually works with medical in South Africa sometimes when patients' load gets so choked, they actually freight some patients to South Africa, also to India, and pay those private hospitals to treat their patients. They do the same thing in the UK too. So there's still a lot of niche 
markets that has niche space is not yet being occupied, that if you plan to go into clinical practice from a private perspective that you can actually handle. That's just one aspect. Research is another. Now, with research, what you're aiming for is providing qualitative solutions. You can eventually devote, devolve that into a business outfit like create a biotech company. Now, a lot of these are futuristic, but it starts with one investment after the other. You can patent products. And now, because what is globalized, it's possible to invent something now via investment and research and patent it while in Nigeria, patent it in the EU or patent it in the US. I've had friends who've done that. I have somebody who did something else to do with fueling vehicles and created a patent for it in the US. Why, first of all, in Europe and then later on in the US, why still in Lagos? Technology has globalized the market. So we start thinking out of the box. We cannot afford to think the way our medical elders thought and expect the healthcare space is going to be different. We need to start thinking outside the public sector being the sole provider of um, um, tertiary healthcare in Nigeria or the major provider of tertiary healthcare in Nigeria. I'll give an example. In Lagos, well, let's, let's, take, let's take Abuja, for instance, now. Invest in Abuja Teaching Hospital, that's state-run, or don't have some um, private um, involvement and all that. But if you look at the teaching hostels who are publicly owned in, in, in Abuja, for instance, the majority of them are large hospitals. And when you look at the total private sector space, the number of beds available to the private sector is so small compared to national hospital, compared to UATH and the likes. So if you're truly going to make impact within the um, private sector in Nigeria, when you start having larger hospitals or an aggregate of small clinics that together provide a larger space. So we're just thinking broadly, okay? And the only way you can scale up in that sense is if we start thinking about health insurance. So outside clean um, service rendition, you can even go into health insurance um, and products. So those are things that we've not thought about. I told someone, for instance, uh, if you own a vehicle in Nigeria, it costs you about maybe 10,000 euro, for instance, to um, pay for your vehicle license. Out of that amount you pay, or maybe even 20,000 euro now, out of that amount you pay, about 5,000 euro goes into minimum third person insurance. Because that's by law, you must have insurance cover at least third person insurance. Now, when we go to register our license for our vehicles, you don't even know who is the insurance company because it's done by some persons there at the FRC. They just give you randomly some company as your insurance provider. There are about 25 vehicles in Nigeria. Think about it. 25,000 vehicles paying about 5,000 euro to some insurance company that nobody knows about. That's about 125 billion euro every year that goes into the insurance pool for third party insurance coverage in Nigeria. Over 125 billion euro. Now that money is never claimed back because when a vehicle, when you bash on that vehicle in Nigeria or someone runs into your vehicle, you don't think about insurance. Nobody calls insurance. It's not like what happens in the West where when there was an issue, the next thing, okay, let's call insurance and put up a claim. And Nigeria nobody thinks about that. So there's a lot of funds that are available in Nigeria and nobody thinks about. It. So imagine if you came up with some idea of universal indemnification. When people recharge their phones, they pay the insurance premium. Okay, you buy five naira credit, five naira or 15 naira goes into insurance premium payment. And you're able to leverage on that large scale and create a large pool of funds and even five people. So with our large economic, um, with a large demographics, with a large population, it is possible to go into health insurance in this country without even going into clinical management, just create a complement of aggregate of health insurance companies. And with such, and in so doing, you can actually begin to intervene in the health space in Nigeria. It is doable. And it's something I'm thinking about in the future, hopefully in the near future, because there is so much that we can do in Nigeria. When Ben Carson was retiring from practice, his last surgery was on a particular Nigerian, and that was the eighth most expensive surgery in, 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 in um, surgical history. It cost about 39 million naira then, um, now it cost maybe probably about 120 million naira if you scale it up now, given the exchange rate. But that entire 39 million naira was raised in Nigeria by an NGO, meaning that if the service, Ben Carson was rendering, neurosurgical service, was domesticated within the Nigerian health ecosystem, Nigerian health space, 
that money would have stayed within. So we could have domesticated that capital. So I love capital freight in form of medical tourism because we're not domesticating certain skills. And that's why we need to begin to, it's, it's a tell us two things. One, we can domesticate a pool of talent here. The hostels are doing that in Lagos and Abuja now who get persons who are um, experts in UK or US and they come once a week or once every two weeks and render that specialized services. That's one. But also tell us two things that you can also raise a lot of those funds from the Nigerian economic system. Contrary to what many people think, the churches are doing that. It's called mass marketing. So 15 hour here, 15 hour here, over a million people is 50 billion. So there is an advantage with large population demographics that we have that we don't leverage enough because every person is chasing just a few upper class or middle class people. Those high net individuals will always be a buffer. Yeah. But if you can liberalize our approach to healthcare by universal identification, there is a lot of funds we can draw from the country's economy and begin to fund um, our hospital system. So it is possible for someone to be charged CS for 1 million error, 1.5 million error, and not have to pay more than 10% because the insurance company can provide it. And why can the insurance company provide that? Because the insurance company has worked with a system of mass marketing and universal identification. In so doing, you see healthcare professionals become better paid. The reason why healthcare professionals are not well paid is because the health sector in Nigeria is in a parallel state. I'll give you this before I round off. Yes, let's take UATH for instance now. You ask the average doctor, are we well paid? No, we're poorly paid. We're poorly paid. We go out to pay other persons. And I tell them, you're correct because your skill set, your level of competence, and your level of education versus your remuneration, it is abysmal. True. And even other parts of the West, even the UK, it's the same argument. I'm sure you know that Jim has been on strike in the UK for a while now. It's the same argument. But look at it. How much money does UATH generate? You may think UATH is probably expensive and all that, but when you go to the finance, and I've done that in UBTH and a number of hospitals, go to the finance department and find out how much money does UATH actually generate in a year. I can guarantee you that UATH will barely be able to generate more than a billionaire every year. I can tell you that for free. But look at what is the payroll of UATH. It will be in the billions. So for every teaching hospital, I've done these calculations, there is at least a three to one asymmetry between the expenditure, majorly based on um, overheads, based on um, um, recurrent like salaries, and then the income. And the federal government only pays salaries. As I do to teaching hospitals, even to teaching students like universities, they only pay salaries. The federal government would not give UATH money to buy consumables, to buy drugs to buy labs and uh, materials and um, consumables testing reagents no no the federal government's contract with uath is to pay salaries after that is the business of the hospital through its igr and drug revolving funds to create a pool of funds to purchase medications to purchase um, lab consumables and likes and diagnostic material consumables and other and build patients with a safety profit margin that can ensure adjusted for inflation that they can purchase those materials again by the time they finish selling um, the drugs and finish running the tests. So every hospital is now under pressure to purchase on CT scan machines, purchase on imaging um, um, machines, purchase on lab machines, purchase on um, medications. The federal government's business is just to pay salaries. Yet, even with that, if UST, if UT, if UATH is, is uh, making a billion naira every year, for instance, now um, in terms of gross income, I'm not talk about net income now, gross income, you'd be shocked to find out, you see UATH will spend at least 3 billion naira every year in terms of salaries and overhead costs. So our hospitals are not profitable. So I ask a question, if you are losing funds, if UATH was a private hospital, it will mean that it's either the slash the salaries of every person in UATH by a third or the increase the cost of services by factor of three, that's times three, which is not sustainable. So the reality is that even though doctors say we're poorly paid, the reality is that if we were actually corporate organizations, we cannot afford to even pay the salaries that are being paid, the abysmal palace salaries are being paid right now. 
So we need to start thinking outside this. It simply applies to investors. The same applies to investors. If lecturers were being paid based on what investors generate, they cannot afford it. But what happens abroad is that the hospitals, they make money through university and demification. That's the funding. So the, the UK government, for instance, is not going to sell crude oil, British Brent crude, and then use that money to subsidize healthcare in, in hospitals. No. The reason why healthcare is free at point of service in the UK is because anybody who's working in the UK pays what we call NI, National Insurance. And that's what funds the NHS. It's about 13% of your salary or 12% sometimes or 10% depends on your income bracket. And then for those who come as students or who, who are immigrants, they pay an IHS, Immigration Health Surcharge. So universal health insurance is what makes healthcare free at point of service in the UK, in Canada, in Australia, and developed nations. So we can begin to key into that and think of universal health insurance scheme by having several doctors investing in creating health insurance companies, HMOs and the likes, and they begin to think creatively about how to fund our health sector so that patients can pay the right price because of their health insurance, and then doctors and nurses can start in properly. Otherwise, we'll keep having a brain drain in Nigeria. The last thing I'll just touch on is health informatics. This is a new sector, a new scope that is building up. And I can tell you, if you're IT oriented and you're listening to me, please start doing some coding, um, um, training sections, um, certifications and the like. Telemedicine, electronic patient records, it's the future of healthcare practice. I can tell you that for free. If you are listening to me and you are IT inclined, I'll say it again, at risk of sounding like a, a broken symbol, I'll say it again. Please do invest in training yourself for AI. Because I've done I've done some research work for some persons who are doing PhD programs here in the UK, um, or postgraduate programs here in the UK at master and PhD levels, and how to supply their materials. AI programs for diagnosing um, CT scans, interpreting CT scans, um, for triaging stroke patients. There's several platforms. The UK is investing heavily in AI, as well as China, as well as US, and as well as some other countries. So if you're in that space of IT, begin to think about certifications in in um, AI computing, in um, coding, that's right, for um, a large um, based softwares and all that. Because there is such a market coming that even in the next five to 10 years, many teachers in Nigeria will have to start devolving into IT platforms. You did, for instance, now, I mean, even before I left um, Nigeria, I'd spent at least 12 years straight in UBTH. The last three years, I wasn't using paper, we using computers. That's how we see patients, that's how we get results. And now it's being extrapolated to other departments in the hospital. So that's the general practice clinic then. So if you're in the IT space, there is a lot of funds coming in that direction. So you can go into medical informatics. That is one green area, one niche area that has not been touched by many um, health professionals. And if we don't go into it, many persons who are computer scientists, who are in other fields, we go into it and they will come sell the, the software to us and they will hijack that space. But imagine if you who has clinical knowledge is one developing those software platforms. Imagine how much more impactful it will be. Imagine how much more user interface friendly it will be. And imagine how much more um, beneficial both to our community, the medical community, and to the um, uh, patient's community. So I would run off here. I'll take questions now. So in, um, I just want us to realize that as damning as the situation is, there's so much opportunities in Nigeria, so much opportunities. Even for those in the diaspora community, I can assure you that many of us are planning to come invest some time in Nigerian healthcare space. I, I've been doing that on skill transfer. I mean, I, I've just been away for about two years plus out of Nigeria. But in the past two year and a half years, I have been to Nigeria about five times in skill transfer sections, in training, spare emergency medicine at UBTH. And I do a lot of these online teachings. We need to start thinking about how we can develop that very, very exciting, evolving, but challenging healthcare economics ecosystem and economic space called Nigeria. Thank you all and God bless you. So much, sir. You're very grateful. Thank you for um, that wonderful presentation.
Um, so while the others on the chat box get their questions ready, I have a question. Um, so can I go ahead? Yeah, please, shoot. Okay, sir. So with regards to health informatics, um, I once did a course um, with the World Health Organization last year, and one of the things they highlighted on is the ethical aspect of it. It's a green area in Africa and Nigeria in particular, but it seemed like in the foreign world, there were lots of ethical re um, regulations with regards to patient data and some other nitty gritty. So in our climb, I know it's evolving, even currently in UHCH, we use you know an EMR or electronic medical record. So for young persons who might be dreaming in that direction, how do we um, amass ourselves with the required knowledge on the ethical aspect and putting our African context into perspective as well as um, merging it with quite, quite all right, so we can learn coding and all of that, but marrying the two together, how do we achieve that in this setting? Thank you for your question. That's an exciting one, um, I must say. Um, you're right. There are ethical concerns about virtually any healthcare product, and it should be that's out there in the market. Um, the fundamental cardinal principle of ethics hasn't changed. I don't think it's going to change anytime soon. A matter of fact, in fact no matter how much you, you expound on them, it still boils to the four things. The four ethos still remain um, no benef no maleficence. That's first of all, do no harm. The beneficence, whatever you do, should be uh, in the patient's best interest. Then, of course, autonomy. The patient should have a right to make a decision of theirs, which is and should be based on informed consent. All right, and then of course justice. It must be fair to the patients. It must be opportunity to seek redress where where necessary and all that. Now, for IT and in the healthcare space, there are some extra things that we consider, extra dimensions to the ethics, and one of them is information governance. So it's important that patient data privacy is maintained. One of the fears of transiting from hard um, paper to um, software. Um, which makes ready access is that because it's readily accessible, you may have information breach. Um, I'm sure you heard about uh, what happened in London Clinic recently when Bridges, um, Kate Middleton went there and then some persons tried to address, tried to assess the records. Now, again, this is a good thing about EMR because each person has a login. If I want to see patients' records, I have to log in using my own sign, my a single sign on in the hospital. So it tells the system has a digital forensics in the archives that tells them, okay, this person tried to access this lab results. Because of your different level of clearance, you may not be able to get certain things. For instance, if I log into the computer, I have a lot of prerogatives because I'm a clinician. If some other person, maybe a clinical support worker or even a lower band nurse, for instance, now in, in my trust, my hospital, logs in, she may be able to access certain platforms or discharge certain patients. So these are the ethical frameworks that have been woven into the software. So you beginning to read about all the kinds of software applications, especially in the developed world, where ethical concerns are way more advanced, you can now begin to be a step ahead, whilst in Nigeria, in creating those safety uh, um, uh, provisions encoded into your own platforms. So that by the time um, your, the hospitals you're selling them to, as maybe some top private hospitals and all that, are seeking GCCI compliance, for instance, now that's an international body that tends to certify private hospitals and see if they are up to date. They find out, ah, your software is always meeting the MAC. Then that becomes a selling point for you. Okay. So it is doable. There are some concerns, even including um, frameworks like health regulation. For instance, in the US, licenses are not, license is not done on a national basis like Nigeria. So you cannot have an MDC license to practice like you have in Nigeria. No, in the US, licensing is done on a state by state basis. So if you want to work in Texas, you have to go apply to Texas Medical Board and get a license to practice there. If you want to move to Oklahoma, you do the same thing. If you want to move to New York, you do the same thing. If you want to go to California, you do the same thing. Then some small states can come up from a cluster that offer maybe three states offer a joint license. But usually, it's on a state-by-state -state basis. So if you're doing telemedicine, the concern is if I'm working in California, for instance, and I have a patient who is um, engaging me via telemedicine from New York, and I don't have a license to practice in New York, does that violate regulations? So there are some other ethical concerns. Then if I'm going to um, issue a prescription um, across states, does that violate those laws? Then to what extent, if I'm going to see a patient online, 
to what extent am I confident that I've examined the person enough or gotten enough of the, the clinical context vis-a-vis -vis the spectrum of symptomatology to now say, okay, this is the prescription I'm making. So there's some concerns about that, all right? But that shouldn't bother you. It's a challenge, but when you get to that bridge, you cross it. How do you cross it? By reading ahead, acquainting yourself with systems that are already working and begin to, wise in Nigeria, begin to incorporate that into your system. Of course, there's always the room for orthotonox, that's local um, uh, concept, sorry, local context. For instance, if I'm in the UK practicing or I'm, or I'm in the US, I, I tend to frequent the US, Canada, and UK, so I know that triangle very well. If I am practicing and talking to a patient, I can say, okay, oh, let me just check this up. I can just go on the database, look at the trust guidelines, look at the national clinical guidelines. The patient is happy because it's patient safety. But if I'm practicing UAT at Gogolada, and I tell the patient that, sorry, let me just check on the system about something, I have lost the confidence of that patient. Even, even when you're conversing, like you know, in UATH, you want to talk to a senior colleague and that the patient feels that all the doesn't know what he's doing. So those cultural contexts are very important when fashioning products. The way products work in China, it's not the same way it works in America. TikTok is a Chinese product, but TikTok in China, is not the same, not to the same liberal extent that is in America or in the West. So why is creating, local, um, creating global concepts also consider local context? Thank you. Thank you very much, sir. We are very grateful. Um, as of now, there has been no other question in the chat box, so I would believe that um, we all understood to a great extent. For those of us um, attending, we'd like to say thank you very much. We appreciate your time, the effort. The session was recorded. For those who could not um, attend now, they will get to listen later and benefit from this. Thank you very much. We are very grateful. Okay, let me just run off with this. I appreciate it. Um, I'll just say this as I bring this to a close. Uh, I, I think I have quite enough time. Um, so I'll, I'll just say this. I still have like 10 minutes left, right? Or even more? Yes, sir. Okay, so, so let me just run off with this. I just want I, I thought of just running off quickly so that I can use the other set of time to answer some questions. I want to encourage everybody out there that this is a very trying time for the uh, Nigerian sector, health sector um, because of the Japa syndrome. Many persons who are listening to me have already made up their minds are going to leave the country regardless. As much as people think that's a problem, which I do recognize that there is a problem in that given the fact that it means that um, progressively we're going to have more of the elderly and the infirm and then the um, zealots are probably, like someone said, idiots left in the country. Yeah, I still see it as a positive or we can spin to come a positive. I don't care whether you want to leave the country or not. My concern is make sure it's the African consensus for the country. What we're doing now, India did it earlier on. And I talk to my colleagues now, a lot of them, who have spent maybe 10 years, 15 years, they're thinking of how to go back and invest in their country. So even when you live in Nigeria, of course, we're leaving our age ones behind, we're leaving our loved ones too behind for many persons, consider how we're going to creatively engineer solutions that would ensure that there's that gradient, it's, if not necessarily plateaued, but that gradient becomes less steep between Nigeria's practice and the global practice. So how can you invest in skill transfer? How can you invest in knowledge transfer? How can you invest even in terms of building um, hubs, consortiums that can serve certain niches? Like I've identified in the electronic, in the um, telemedicine experts, the health informatics, and also in terms of um, funding research and health insurance. I'm very passionate about health insurance and universal indemnification because ultimately that's one thing that will ensure that will provide high quality low cost service to the end user. Not because healthcare is cheap. Healthcare in the UK is free at point of service, yes. But to do a CT scan, for every CT scan I request in hospital at night, for instance, it costs the NHS about seven to 800 pounds per patient, but it's free to that person, but it costs the NHS 700 to 800 pounds. ECG in the UK, if you go to a private hospital in the UK, ECG is at least 125 pounds. One ECG, just to do it, that'll take five minutes to run, 125 pounds. To convey a patient 
from the community to the hospital costs at least about 700 pounds. In New York, it's a thousand to twelve thousand dollars. That's what we're saying in the US that if you were in a coma and you recovered in the ambulance, jump out because that should be bankrupt you. Because in the US, you pay for it, but in the UK, it's free. Why? Because there's universal identification. So we can use those pool of funds to pay people properly and at the same time render high quality, low cost healthcare services. So that's really to broaden our thoughts. Let's not give up on Nigeria or the, on the health space, whether you're in Nigeria, you're in Canada, you're in Australia, or the US tomorrow. Think about how we can develop our country's healthcare ecosystem and make it a better place for the next generation to come. Thank you all. Thank you, Investor Abuda, teaching us to Guagalada. I uh, thank you for um, God's gospel and all those who are part of inviting me here. Thank you so much and God bless you. Amen. Thank you, sir. Grateful. Thank you. All right, everyone. Um, we've come to the end of the session. For those who would want the link to the recordings, it will be sent across the platforms through which I assessed you earlier. Um, Let's drop our appreciation in the chat box for our speaker as well. And of course, for our house officers primarily, I'm a reminder that our dinner and awards night is on Saturday um, at the University of Abuja Teaching Hospital here. Yeah? And let's keep that in our calendars. And of course, if there are any potential sponsors who are listening to us this evening and you want to reach out, we're also available for sponsorship. Thank you very much, everyone, and may God bless us all. Thank you.